Well, most of us are back, so hopefully you all uh, stayed awake during the movie. It, it, it's a pretty, well, I was going to say the monster scenes kept you awake or the cute dog thing kept you awake. Either way, but I want to talk just briefly about it. We obviously have our classic hero's journey. All right, I mean, when we, when we begin this story, we see, you know, we, we see him confront that ant creature, and of course, he absolutely freezes, right? Like that, uh, I think we have a slide there. We see Joel, and he's freezing, and he can't do it. And of course, it, it's contrast then as he's standing there with the creature. Of course, it's then mid-film as he begins to come out of that. Of course, it's to save the dog. And then in the final scene, we actually see you know, he's confronting a giant monster, but now he's actually learned some things, and in fact, this is not the real monster, Cap's the real monster, right? So, and, and honestly, for anybody who watches a lot of movies, I, I, could, I could spend a long time talking about parallels just with other films, but what this one borrowed thematically from pretty heavily, I'm gonna guess some people will catch right away, is another movie called How to Train Your Dragon. Which, which introduces us to a character. I mean, Joel and Hiccup actually have a lot in common when we meet them at the beginning of the film. They seem to be sorely lacking compared to their fellows. They feel inferior. Their fellows are either fighting monsters or fighting dragons. They feel really like the underdog. They want to be great warriors like the people around them. But then life takes them on a very, very different journey that it absolutely grows them, but they don't specifically become the exact warrior or, or person they thought that they wanted to be. In fact, they actually become something kind of new, kind of a third thing. Right here we have, not all the dragons are bad in How to Train a Dragon, not all the monsters are bad, and of, and of course there's a girl, right? So, and in the end, then, in the end, the entire kind of world situation and the community is transformed. And so, it, this type of story, the hero's journey, turns up in a number of different forms, but that's just easy. You begin to see some of these stereotypes, and I want to focus on three things just to keep things tight for a little bit of, of lessons this evening. The first one is, really, if we just watch Act 1, just like with that movie I mentioned, How to Train Your Dragon, I think there's, there's a lesson to be considered right there in Act 1, then there's obviously the journey to explore, and then ultimately, um, I think one really unique message to be digested, hopefully not by a sand gobbler. So uh, the first lesson, I think that we actually see it, we almost have to pause and think about it unique from the outcome of the film, and it's really a lesson to be considered about contentment. And something we could miss, especially, uh, especially young people watching a movie like this and just wanting the hero to change and be awesome, there's really an aspect of contentment that, that we could miss right there in Act 1, which, which he does cue into later in, in the movie. We see he's got this discontent with his role and discontent with his place. And by place, I don't mean the, the actual bunker, although that, that becomes true too. I mean, I mean the colony, his place with the people. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 actually tells us, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. I think the Bible would call us to a unique form of contentment with our lives and, and to put off some forms of anxiety. And honestly, to just admit something, the world will not always meet all of our desires. Joel, being in the film, right, he's obviously suffering with self-image, and, and he feels judged. In fact, they kind of rehearsed that speech, right? He feels like his contribution is of lesser value and of course, the story will change him, but before we get there, the lesson we need to consider is the type of lesson we learn from passages in the Bible like Romans 12, or 1 Corinthians 12, something about 12. Our Romans 12 talks about everyone ought to think of themselves not more highly than they ought to think, but with sober judgment according to the measure of faith God's assigned. It goes on to say we have our one body with many members. It's that illustration of a community being one. The members don't have all the same function. And, and, and so having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Right? And someone does have to be the chef. I mean, even on a submarine. Like my buddy Mark Ancio is not here, but he like, there are roles in every community. Somebody's got to make the minestrone and somebody's got to fix the radio. Like, those things have to actually occur. It's the same thing in How to Train Your Dragon. Somebody has to be the blacksmith to make all the weapons for the guys that wield it, right? 
1 Corinthians 12 says, if all were a single member, where would the body be? There are many parts, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you, right? On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there'll be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. One member is honored, all rejoice together. Right? You take out a monster, everybody should rejoice, even the cook. Right? You do that together. That's, that's a biblical illustration and a framework that actually is countercultural to some aspects of humanity throughout time. That doesn't mean we can't grow or accrue certain skills, and certainly Act 2 and 3 changes Joel. But even though he does grow in the film and overcomes his ability to, to freeze, right? Blows up a monster, but his tactics and skills become very different, and he's making the book, right? He's very unique, and even then, he hasn't just become like the other people he wanted to be like. And so some of us will never have certain gifts, whether that's due to genes or body type or brains or injury, right? We all have limitations, but that doesn't make us lesser. Like, that's a biblical manifestation of community that actually is counter to many aspects of community or abuse of man in human history. And so Joel's discontent with his colony and goes off in search of love, we'll get to that in a minute, right? But indeed, but he actually doesn't get, or at least doesn't get yet, the outcome that he goes in search of. In fact, he chooses to go back, and to what? To his family, right? He says at the end, he traveled 85 miles, and what he wanted and needed was actually his community, but, but then taking them out, getting them out together. Right? Maybe Amy comes into the picture sometime down the road, or up, up the mountain, right, if they survive the snow spiders. But that becomes less important. More things in life become of value instead of one singular focus. He reads the back of that map and realizes he was ungrateful for what he did have. And at the end, right, he says, he says he goes back to take his community, his family, literally out of the dark and into the light, right? And so there's a lesson here about contentment, even as the film will end with a sense of what, we might, what might actually be a, a holy discontent, a good kind of discontent. Like Joel's journey wasn't about love the traditional rescue the princess kind, or get the girl. The love actually is a whole exploration of what love means, which is actually kind of cool for what this movie is about. And Mavis basically spells it out for us, right in the middle of the film, if we're paying attention. Right, well, she actually spells out options one, two, three. She's actually setting up a very wink kind of moment at the narrative of what's going to occur, right? She says, don't give up on your quest, Joel. When you see her, she'll appreciate the grand romantic gesture implied by your journey, be moved by her kindness and leadership qualities. Or, another option is, she won't see those qualities in you. You'll have traveled a great distance only to be met with disappointment, but perhaps you'll have learned valuable lessons along the way. Like she's just telegraphing the real point of this movie you know, in a major way. Or, the third option, you don't survive and get eaten by mutated insects and amphibians. There's so many ways you perish, right? All right, so there's three options. One is, and if you think about how you apply that in a general sense to the narrative journey, one, maybe life has meaning and we have to rescue our princess or our life is a failure. Or option three, right, life is meaningless and you're just going to get eventually chewed up. Or option two right there in the middle, life has meaning but sometimes it isn't always what we're focused on. Sometimes the point or the object that we're headed for isn't really what that story is about and maybe we're supposed to learn or, or even our path isn't what we think it is. And, and honestly, that's really only true if there is objective meaning to life and a designer, or might I say storyteller, who, who actually in, endows it with that meaning and value. Proverbs actually tells us this, that man makes his plans and the Lord determines his steps. We jump into the New Testament, Ephesians 2 says, were God's workmanship created in Christ for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we could walk in them. And in Romans, Romans promises all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So life has meaning where it goes, even when it's hardships, trials, or not what we intend. To those who actually know and believe in God, he is, all of that narrative has meaning. It's not just random crud that happens to us. Even when things don't go as planned, there's a greater narrative working out, it says, for our good. And that, that's what a lot of heroes' journeys in fiction are. This is certainly what we'd like to believe, or how we'd like to believe the world works. 
Sometimes even hardship and the helplessness are how God teaches us the things we need to learn. And so when we explore Joel's journey, the question is, or is that the first question I got into with my podcast buddies talking about this movie is, what is the love in Love and Monsters? Because it turns out that the monsters weren't everything that we thought they were, right? You can tell by the eyes. There, there were some are docile, some are, you know, the, the, the sky jellies, which I think they imported from Avatar. But, but just as the monsters in the title aren't all that we assumed they were or how they would work out to be, the love part of the film, I think, is a play on that as well. Because the love that is explored is not what we initially suppose it to singularly be. Some of the monsters are Joel's impotent, right? Some of the monsters are monsters, and Joel's impetus for leaving is about romantic love, but much of the film focuses on other kinds of love, which is pretty cool because if we look in Scripture in the New Testament, look in Greek, there are at least four different words that we see get used for love. Romantic love, or familial love, or friendship love, brotherly love, or, or sacrificial love. Those were, there's a lot more goes into each of those terms and concepts, but for the sake of time, we'll just just go with some, some easy ones. But right, so the movie starts and we think, oh, this is a movie about eros, right? romantic love. But most of us think when we hear the word love today, that's what we kind of think of. It's, it's that. Romantic, seeking intimacy. And I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong or bad. In fact, there's a biblical principle at work here as well. I mean, we see Joel's longing at the beginning, and Genesis tells us it's not good for man to be alone. Right? Male and female were created by God. Marriage has its place. So it is sad that, that you know, everybody's coupled up and like, Joel is alone. Like, that, that's, that's not happy. But to think that we have nothing in life, if that isn't satisfied. And like she says, like, there's nothing for me here. And then you realize, I love those people. What was I thinking? That you were missing something. Too singularly focused on one aspect of love that maybe the world or culture would just kind of pinion us to. And so then we see he goes out, and we get a little bit of uh, phileo, where we get to see some brotherly love, although it's not really with a man so much as man's best friend, right? Makes his friend, boy. Classic boy and his dog story. It was, it was, an, it was an impossible journey, and more than the incredible journey. Right, that they're bound, and it's, here we have, it was probably the sweetest part of the movie for me, because well, I have a dog, so... But we see that they're bound together by shared losses. That's, that's really such sometimes how friendships come together. And they're facing the world together as allies, together. And they help and sacrifice for each other in the times of danger. And in fact, we see how does Joel ultimately unfreeze? It's not to save himself. So we actually see growth through the friendship. He, un he unfreezes when boy is in danger. He's finally able to kind of break that cycle and, and begin to grow. Right? Scripture even says, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Or in this case, maybe be willing to lay it down for man's best friend. And then we see the, the risk for something that isn't even friendship, right? And Joel tells us at the movie's end, what, I'm alive because of the generosity of a few strangers and the kindness of a great dog. And so we see strangers, like the hospitality of strangers is a key ingredient. The movie can end right here. In terms of, of love, he's saved and helped and trained by, by Clyde Minow, right? They, they become friends, but they start as strangers. And it's straight out of the biblical concept as well, right? Hebrews 13, 2 tells us, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. That's some pretty awesome hospitality. Even Old Testament law in Leviticus says, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you your traveling friend, as the native among you. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's a godly command. And of course, when we talk about helping the stranger, especially when like, she's not laid, laid in a ditch by robbers, it's more laid in a hole by sand gobblers. But there's an aspect of the Good Samaritan story that Jesus relates to us when it's talking about who's my neighbor, right? The Good Samaritan sees the man on the side of the road, helps the stranger, pays for his welfare, heals him. In this case, they help him out of the hole and train him to survive, right? And we see that kind of love, the love from a stranger, the willingness to lay down 
a dog and a boy risking their life for another, ultimately see that he's really embraced agape love, right? Because Joel, Joel is then, well, he's saved by Amy and the colony as well. He only makes it with multiple types of friend, love from strangers, dogs, and friends. And we see that then she is, we see Amy's less, Amy with uh, one eye and two eyes, is concerned less about, in an imminent sense, the romantic is not priority one. She's loving her community. It's not that I can never have a place, but there's something more imminent that needs doing. Serving her colony. We see that sacrificial love in her, even for, you know, it seemed to be primarily, you know, the old folks, right? You could be calloused in that. And we see her have this sacrificial love as well. And then Joel even shows kindness to Cap's the monster, right? The monster crab. Kindness to the monster, which then ultimately flips the tables, releases it from its bonds. He risks his life. I mean, it's a crab creature. It could have said, thanks, man. Oh. And he, he's willing to try to do an ultimate self-sacrifice to turn the tide. And then we actually get to see, of course, the real monster, right? Australians. <laughs> I'm hoping someday my, my friends the Glens will watch this since they live there, and then, then I'll get a, a nasty email or something. But and we should pause to mention those who lack love. That's a movie about monsters, and the story reminds us sometimes the enemy isn't out there, but it's actually in our midst. In fact, I'm going to preach Sunday on the book of Jude, where it says certain people have crept in unnoticed. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality. They feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, or their crap, right? For whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever, or by this, the crab stomach. So, right, there, there are people in our midst who maybe are not our people. That's the idea of, of sometimes there's the visible church and the invisible church. Some people might be in there, they might be wolves. And then we see familial love as well. We're back to the point where Joel realizes how much he misses his own colony and how important that love was and turns the map over and sees all of those notes. And, and now, now it's true. There's a real, they share, he and Amy share a romantic kiss before leaving, but they're not together at the end like a lot of romantic comedies or a lot of love stories. It's a nice touch of it, just a touch of difference to the formula. Like many movies, romantic love trumps everything. And this movie actually makes us turn around and consider all the different aspects of love that, that our scripture would call us to. And love monsters achieving that romantic love end may not be what happens to you, may not be the most important thing, or it may not be the time and the place. It may require more patience, and it may require some contentment. I guess that's it's where we get to the classic love verse, probably said at every wedding, right? 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, kind, doesn't boast or have envy, it's not arrogant or rude, it doesn't insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. And endures all things, in the case of this movie, is kind of what then brings us to our final point, right? Um, the message that perhaps is very timely for us to digest. Then the final message, right, that people come out of hiding. Like this movie came out last year. It's like, oh, a bunch of people, the, the world has completely irrevocably changed and people are hiding, afraid to come out. It's just like, that's good timing, right? But it's also, it's a great metaphor in every era for the Christian life, but perhaps after a year of pandemic, it's, it's oddly fitting. Joel's admonition at the end, he says, don't get me wrong, surface is a dangerous place, but I don't think hiding is the answer anymore. There's a great, big, beautiful, inspiring world out there, and I know you think it might be impossible, but it's not. If I can survive out here, anybody, literally anybody can. So crank over the hatch, breathe some fresh air, live your life, it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. And it's, it's that idea, whether it's talking about the basic human condition, or whether we're talking about some biblical principles that life, a life truly lived involves risk. Otherwise, it's just existing to exist. I'm already starting to read articles right now about, about talking about vaccinated people and other things. Now we're going to have to face a season of our irrational fears. 
after being locked down and having good measures of caution and now learning how to live with, we were writing the book on the virus, right? Lots of illustrations. Maybe dogs or shoot in the face with a shotgun, right? I mean, there's learning to live with what is in our midst, learning to cope with it, learning ways to hand, get a handle on it. But yet all of that year of hiding, there's still a lot of, now there's an irrational side that says, well, I'm afraid to open the hatch, right? I'm afraid to shift back into living with it in the ways that we are developing. And we have some irrational fears manifesting post-pandemic. A lot of articles coming out about that I just read last week. People afraid to leave their homes, waiting for the world to be no risk. We actually never had that. But now we have scientists and statistics and ways to manage this virus the same way if they're coming to figure out how to manage the monsters, thanks to eight-year-old girls and and a guy walks over from his set on The Walking Dead, right? So there's, there's people braving these things to figure them out. And some people have to go forward to do that first. Just like this movie with the monsters. Without Clyde and Minnow or Joel creating the book, we wouldn't have the means to retake and live in their world. Some had to risk early. Some had to risk when it was most severe. And then in the end, others can then follow in their stead. And think that that's why there's practically and spiritually a way to apply this. Because we can apply it to pandemic practicalities right now, but the temptation for Christians in every immoral pagan age of this planet is often to disengage from the world too. Right? In John 17, Jesus is praying for his followers to God. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in truth. Now, Jesus calls us to risk for the gospel to be out in the world. And sometimes that's spiritually. Sometimes it's also practically. I mean, sometimes missionaries have to go brave, dangerous, maybe not exactly like that, but but they brave a lot of dangers to take the gospel out into the world. They face persecution. They face monsters of a sort. Even if those monsters look like you and me. I were called to risk as Christians for the gospel. And sometimes that even means going to places and in times when there is peril or sickness or potential for death. We don't have the book of we don't have the, the book of monsters, volume one or two. But we have the good news of Jesus in books. 1 through 66, right? And we're called to carry it around the world, and we're called to call people and point them toward that ultimate kingdom. Not up in the mountains, but up in that sense. We might face dangers from without or dangers from within, but Jesus calls us to take the risk. And so it's, it's amazing to me how much can come to me and remind me about the faith that I have from a comedy movie about monsters. But if you look hard enough, and I think sometimes if we take the narrative deep dive, it, it can actually open up a hatch into a whole new world. Uh, that's all I will mention tonight, although there's more fun things to talk about with this movie. But for now, I guess, uh, signing off, James Harlan. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you tonight that we can meditate on, on the stories that we encounter in this world and uh, the fun and frivolities we can take. And I, I think that as Christians, we can think about how, how monsters might mirror fears we have in this world, whether they are very practical and, and do involve physical risks in our life. And the right amount of concern, caution, equipping, and care, but also the willingness to, to be out and about, helping neighbors, helping strangers, uh, loving them in the variety of ways that we can understand love is, even from this movie. And so I think you need to give us those things to wrestle with, and the, and the constant reminders that, that as much easy as it would be to hide from the world, or even cloister ourselves in Christian bunkers, uh, you call us to a bravery of sorts. Because sometimes we find out that, uh, that whether it's a dog, or whether it's the strangers Joel encounters. God, you, 
Sometimes there are other family members out there, and you ask us to risk and to speak the truth and bring the good and best book and see if we can bring some of them into the fold. And so I think that we can muse on these things a bit with one another, that actually um, any story like this can remind us in certain ways of how we relate to you, how we relate to our neighbors, and, uh, and even how we steward your creation. And so we thank you for these times. Thank you for myriad ways we can connect over them and ask that you would bless us as we ramp back up with this ministry and see if there are ways we can invite others to share in the storytelling and pointing to your story in your name.